This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the AIPIS show for accredited income property investment specialists and those who aspire to be. If you're a real estate, mortgage, or financial professional, this is the place for you. We'll explore innovative investment analysis, sales, marketing, and income generating strategies for the most historically proven wealth creator, income property. Learn from the experts as they show you how to build a better business and a better life. It is my pleasure to welcome Kerry Lutz back to the show. He hasn't been on for a while because we had this big case that I've talked to you about, and Kerry Lutz was one of my witnesses in the case. Kerry, it's great to have you back. You are a recovering attorney. So before we dive into the meat of today's show, I'd like to talk a little bit about the case. Because right. you did testify, and I thank I you I was your that. star witness yeah. <laughs> here, Jason. Hey, just remember, I dropped uh, some sound bites. Like that, they basically conducted a digital lynching against yeah. you, digital assault. Well, let me let me talk about tell what this is about. Sure. So I did a whole show on this before, folks, and so you've maybe saw that episode where I had one of our legal team on the show, and and he talked about the case. But basically, I had this competitor trying to gain market share, ruin my business. This started about five years ago. They did an incredible job of it. They hired a marketing agency to ruin me and ruin my reputation, ruin my life. And so we took them to court. It took four years to get there. We had an eight-day trial. The jury deliberated for one day. It was in federal court. We won a verdict, a jury award of $55 million. It was a, a nice big jury award. Then they filed some motions, got that whittled down to $28 million in change, and so it was about 32 million with interest, I think, on the judgment. And now there's another motion pending, so we haven't been able to start any collection yet. But since Kerry was there, and a lot of this could apply to anybody watching or listening, because everybody has a reputation, and many of you have a business that depends on your reputation. And so that's why this is so important. And like Kerry said, it was a basically a digital lynching. That's a good way to put it. It, it really that yeah. is, sums it up very well. Totally, totally. I never saw people this determined. You know, if they had just put that energy into legitimately building their business, they would have been far better off, and they wouldn't have a judgment against them for uh, thirty-two million dollars. It's just wasted energy and effort. But this is what sociopaths do: they thumb their nose up at the system, and they really. Uh, it's a it's game to them. They get a high from it, yeah. I guess. And yeah. uh, these guys got slapped. Then your problem is, uh, hey, whether you get paid or not, where do you go to get your reputation back? Yeah. And that that's the hardest part. Yeah, you've been vindicated, yeah. but the people you lost as clients are gone. Well, You're not getting them not back. Just that podcast guests. So you know some guests yeah. that just won't come on the show. And he, I mean, you didn't want to come on the show for quite a while because you were concerned that maybe what they were saying was true, or you know, you didn't just want to be like affiliated. And you know, there there's all of that. But you know, or, I'm or glad, they I'm come glad after me. Saw, yeah, or yeah. they come after me. Right. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. But they were pretty pathetic, and you got some measure of justice. Hopefully, you get some money too. But at least you've been vindicated. Yeah. That uh, that what they were doing was downright illegal and just just wrong. You know, folks, I call this the crime of our time because it could happen to anybody. And it's so easy to do. I think one of the things they testified to, if I recall correctly, is that they, they only spent like $10,000 to try and destroy my businesses and destroy my life. And it's so easy to do this stuff. But we hired the investigators. We did the thing. We learned all about it. And we figured it out. We found out who was doing it. And then we, you know, we took them to court and, and got justice. So if you want to know more about that, listen to my prior episode on it, because everybody watching and listening has a reputation that took a lifetime to build. And you can get some bad apples that try and destroy it very quickly. Carrie, you are tracking so many great things on your show, the Financial Survival Network. And there was a recent case, and since you're a former attorney, America's maybe, top recovering attorney <laughs> and comedian. By the way, Carrie does great stand up comedy, he's really funny. But why don't you tell us about that and let's okay. uh, dig in and tie so, in with the financial world? It was a case where uh, 
federal judge in Louisiana, I believe, Jerry Dowdy, put an injunction, a preliminary injunction against the U.S. government from censoring and, and contacting, not just censoring, contacting any social media unless it's a national security ma- yeah. matter, a criminal matter, or some other very narrow. Otherwise, they can't go to Twitter and say, you know what, uh, Jason, we don't like him. Just take him down. Right. And that's what they were doing en masse. It's unbelievable. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, certain uh, companies that uh, whose names are... Uh, Alphabet companies, yeah. <laughs> you know, we used to have alphabet agencies. We're like actually alphabet. <laughs> yeah, alphabet <laughs> are company. actively <laughs> censoring me. Yeah, of course. You yeah. know, throttling my uh, my channel for years. They've been doing yeah. it, and I've got proof of it. But you know, what am I going to spend ten million dollars to go after them? It just it, you it, can't beat them. You know, that's interesting that you say that because we were talking about my big case, and Google came into play in the case. Because, of course, they were using, at times, Google yeah. products and services to ruin me. And so, you know, we sent subpoenas to Google, and Google fought the subpoena. Like, they don't even have a dog in this fight. And they just are incredibly difficult. And I would have had to hire a lawyer in another state to go and deal with Google and make motions to force Google's hand. These companies are too damn big, and they are simply evil. You know, you use Twitter as the example because the government did do that, but now they probably wouldn't go to Twitter at all. They'd go to Meta yeah. <laughs> and Threads Facebook and, and Facebook uh, and yeah, Instagram. Sure. And that. Yeah, it's, Everything. Uh, it's, it's absolutely awful. But this was a great verdict. And the Supreme Court came down with some really good decisions recently as well. Is the tide turning? Are we at a yeah. point where we're going to get some more liberty finally? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, I looked at the judge's decision Ironically, it was handed down July 4th, oh, that's which beautiful. is a statement in and of itself. Right. Read that case, pretty much it's bulletproof. Mm-hmm. I don't think they'll maybe chip around the edges. Eventually, it's going to go to the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. Uh, the admin made a motion to uh, stay his, uh, his judgment, his injunction. I don't think he's going to al- allow it. So then they'll have to put in... Maybe they're putting in an emergency appeal. I think they have to go to the trial judge first yeah. to, for a stay. He's not going to do it. Um, it really potentially is going to turn the tide. Uh, but, you know, the need to be treated, these big social media companies, as common carriers. Yeah. Like FedEx can't say, well, I don't like Jason. I'm not going to deliver, deliver his packages. Package. Yeah, yeah. I'll take them and he yeah. could pay us. Right. We just won't deliver it. And, you know, the post office or Verizon can't say, you know, we hate Jason's podcast. He says bad things about us. We'll just shut him down. And remember when PayPal was doing that? You Mm -hmm. know, it's, it's just, folks, this whole censorship thing is the most important issue of our era. Like there is literally no more important issue than this. Even Uh, GoFundMe and uh, Patreon, Uh all of them, uh, they're all in it. And, and then you have banks shutting people's bank accounts down because exactly. they don't like what they're doing or reporting their transactions to the government because yeah. the government asked them. It's all part of the same totalitarian web that they're trying to lock us into. And that ties into the Great Reset, which is just a communist uh, totalitarian thing to take over the world. Okay, so before we get into the Great Reset, us. let me just touch on the big tech companies, okay? So we'll do, we'll do the Great Reset, but what needs to happen is I've been saying for 12 years, I w- I've been saying this, these big tech companies need to be treated as common carriers, okay? If you're talking on the phone and the phone company doesn't like what you're talking about, they don't have the right to cut your service off, okay? Exactly. And so common carriers... And or they needed to be busted up under antitrust laws. That they're, too. they're way too big. For sure. And number three, their algorithms and codes need to be made public. Absolutely. So that the whole world of geeks out there can audit why when we search Google, do we get the results we get? Why when we look at Facebook, do we see the things we see in our newsfeed and not other things, right? Because you can't hear the dogs that don't bark. And if you don't see or hear something, you can't think about it. 
you can't evaluate it. So for example, if there's a big medical thing going on in the world and the powers that be are recommending that everybody get a certain thing in their arm, Okay. Get a jab. Yeah, you know, don't say that. (laughs) Jabs are okay. (laughs) Jab. Yeah, we know what you mean. Okay. You know, what if there's an alternative point of view? If you never see it, if you never hear it, you'll never think about it. What about the last election? A certain 'er ne'er-do-well son of a uh, prominent politician uh, was totally in the bag. You know, we don't need to rehash all the details. The code you need to use for that is not that word. Because that'll be that the thought police will be out. You need to use the word erection. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, he had certain he had certain uh, pursuits that he indulged in that were recorded and everything else and involving totally drugs, drugs, yeah, and drugs and money laundering and everything else. And uh, for a vast part of the population, they didn't even know about. And, it. and remember, one guy went on national TV on his big cable news channel and exposed mm-hmm. all of that in great detail. And then he was censored. I, it's just and eventually fired. Yeah, and eventually fired. And now, you know, he's he's over at a new place. So it's absolutely crazy. So take us into the Great Reset. Let's tie this in with the financial world, yeah. what it means yeah. to everybody watching and listening, what it means for their money well, and their future. They want to make us all slaves in the new digital economy. They want you to be a digital slave. Mm-hmm. And uh, they want to just basically tell you what to do, what to think. We have thought police, even the government, uh, disinformation. Oh, but we're not going to be able to stop disinformation now that Judge Dowdy enjoined us from talking to social media. You know what? I'd like to be able to decide what's disinformation. I don't want um, Zuckerberg disinformation is, is another man's reality. Okay. Yeah. So so they want to control everything. And they've made large steps to do it. I think the welfare warfare state is directly tied into this. Obviously, they want a global currency and... And a digital global currency did, where, yeah. where, they, where they can audit everything you buy, everything you spend on, they can control it. So, Carrie, we all know that central bank digital currencies are coming, known as CBDCs. Is there anything we can do to defend ourselves against this massive control grab, and invasion of privacy. This is headed our way. I don't think there's anything that's going to stop it other than uh, defeating these people, first getting them out of the U.S., because so goes the U.S. Yeah, You can't do it without the United States. But China loves this. Yeah, I'm not sure that I think it's too far. I think uh, that it's going to happen. And all you can do is be prepared for it. There's nothing else you could do. It's happening. So maybe have some of your money outside of that system. Um, yeah, some gold, silver. Yeah. I don't really uh, have any great faith in crypto, but have a few percent of your wealth in crypto. Yeah. You know, a few thousand. Maybe that's not a bad idea. Gold, when you, silver. When you say crypto, do you want to distinguish Bitcoin from other crypto? By yeah, means? Bitcoin, because a lot of it is tied in and, yeah. you know, they can just produce as much of it as they want. The great thing about Bitcoin is... They can't uh, produce any more of it other than the couple percent a year that gets produced yeah, by miners. crypto miners, right? Nothing else. Yeah. That's it. So, yeah. I'm curious, though, uh, why don't you have any great faith in crypto? I mean, there are obviously people who absolutely love Bitcoin. I, I think mm-hmm. it's completely different from any other crypto, you know, because just Bitcoin specifically. Be- because Bitcoin requires these nodes. Yeah. And the nodes record the blockchain, and those nodes can be shut down. And there's only X number of thousands of them. They vary depending on the price of Bitcoin and uh, how many people are mining it at any given time. But it's easy. The nodes are out there. There's a map of them. Mm -hmm. And they can either digitally shut down every node or they can go physically shut them down, bash the servers, so imagine if they shut down every node for 72 hours, you can't find out what the price of Bitcoin is. Mm-hmm. That's the end. Right. It's over. And they can do it. Yeah. So it's within their ability. People say, no, no, it can't be done. Right. Yes. And the other thing is, what happens, Jason, when they pass a law and say that uh, you know possession with intent to distribute Bitcoin, yeah. you can spend five years in jail for Are you going to risk going to jail for five years? That's exactly what I've always said about 
all cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, is they'll just make it illegal. I mean, look, they've been making a concerted effort, Operation Choke Point, to shut down the on and off ramps and control the exchanges. I unfortunately agree. And as I've always said, I want to be wrong about this. I hope Bitcoin succeeds wildly and takes over the world. I really do. Mm-hmm. But I just have my reservations. I once saw a bumper sticker and it said, don't steal. The government hates competition. <laughs> I've seen that one, yeah. The ultimate theft is and the ultimate test of sovereignty is the ability to create your own monetary unit and print it mm-hmm. and use that to get get the populace to do what you want them to do. Because right. back in the old days of uh, pre-central uh, banking, you know, we went from like uh, Andrew Jackson through to 1913 without a central bank. Country did just fine. Yeah, we're going to have banking crises, whether there's a CBDC or not. It's going to happen. They're peddling it as this is the cure to all. The well, that's how they peddled the Federal Reserve in 1913. They said that was the cure. OK, so we've all got this concern about CBDCs coming, and that is what it is. It's a complex topic. There's a lot to it. But I do want to switch to just the regular economy <laughs> and the, the real stock economy. The, well, the, yeah, well, I don't the know. The real, about, unreal yeah, economy. Yeah, the real, unreal economy. Exactly. The Main Street and Wall Street. So stock market, real estate, economy in general. I mean, it's amazing how resilient the real estate market has been in the face of massive in- interest rate increases. It's amazing how resilient the jobs market has been, and really the stock market even to a lesser degree. I mean, these are historic measures. The Fed has been so hawkish, so aggressive. Thoughts? On the one hand, they're hawkish. On the other hand, we have a banking crisis taking place. So they're priming the pumps, dumping money into the system. So maybe the net result is there's more money floating around you just don't know about. Plus, Higher returns bring money off the sidelines, whether it's buying bonds or higher yielding dividend stocks, whatever. What I like to say is we're in a recession. We've been in a recession. In fact, for the past 20 years, we've been in a recession because they've never honestly measured the inflation rate. The inflation rate is probably double what the stated rate is. We go back to John Williams, shadow stats, 12% right now. So- even at 12%, and even if you're buying a house and paying 7%, you're making a 5% real return because the money, the dollars that you're paying back are worth 12% less, and you're paying 7%, so 5%. Um, but right. we've been in a real recession for since 08 and 09. So it's never changed. Let's talk about that. Why do you say that? And I think you're going to say... Because of the faulty inflation measure, it means that the GDP measure is faulty. Exactly. Because remember, when you understate inflation, you overstate the GDP. And yeah. the way you measure recession is by declining GDP for two quarters. Right? right. So Exactly. So there's a thing called the real rate of return and the nominal rate. So if profits are up 5 6%, and the stated GDP is 2%, a stated inflation rate is 2%, yeah. then you're effectively making your growth rates 4%. It's called the GDP deflator. Yeah. And they apply that to the GDP numbers. But if your profits are up 5%, but inflation's up 10%, that means your real rate of return is down 5%. Yeah. And the real rates of return in the U.S. economy have never recovered from the 08, 09 debacle, yeah. the real estate collapse and the economic, global economic collapse. So at best, we've been treading water with no growth. And at worst, we certainly for the past two, three years, we've been in a recession. Okay, so that's interesting because I agree with you because I certainly know that the statistics are all fake news, right? So if we measured inflation correctly, then we'd measure GDP correctly, and we should measure unemployment correctly, too, which is another scam. I had John Williams on my show. I'm sure Mm -hmm. he's been on his show, too. So uh, we we talked about shadow stats. But here's the funny thing. A lot of people have talked about how so many great companies were founded during recessions, 
And if we look, mm -hmm. you know, last time around, you know, big, huge companies that have taken over the world, founded during recessions, the first, the world's first billionaire, J. Paul Getty, made all his money during a recession, right? And so if we've been in a recession since the financial crisis, since the GFC, then look at all the people who have made so much money in that recession, in real estate, in stocks, in oh, yeah. businesses, and everything else. So that, it's just kind of an interesting point. Inflation is the asset investor's greatest ally. Yeah. I mean, we've got your whole system based upon that. Inflation-induced debt destruction. Yeah. So if I've got an asset that's got leverage, debt, and I can get other people in the form of real estate or whether you're leasing equipment, whatever, real estate, a little more, less risky in a lot of respects, get somebody else to pay the debt, and I put no money down, and in... 10 years, I paid off a good portion of that debt, but a dollar has been inflated by 20, 30 percent. And that's at the very least, right? because just their inflation rate of 2 percent. So it's 5 percent. Point is, there's a lot more dollars floating around there. I've, I've kept this asset at no direct cost to myself. Mm -hmm. I've actually been earning a return on it. This is why real estate's still so hot. And the best way, I know you had Walter Williams on your show. He used to say, if you want to get wealthy or build a financial nest egg, stay out of trouble with yeah. the law, yeah. get married, yeah. buy a house. Yeah. Both of you work. Right. And that really is a surefire. And sure don't fire get pregnant left. too young. Yeah. Wait but, a little longer. Yeah. yeah. Right. Or, but not or, as long as people are waiting. Or now. never. Yeah, yeah. Or never yeah. is okay, too. Yeah. You know, yeah. this I'm is, a big fan of increasing the yeah. population. I'm a, we got a population father of three kids. Yeah. And if I think how much money I've grandfather, uh, too. Yeah. If I think how much money I spent on them, you know, yeah. I'd be retired. I'd be in a villa. Yeah. In the but, but, uh, but now they're all stimulating the economy. They have their own jobs, their yeah. own lives. Not yeah. doing me any yeah. good, but yeah. yes. Okay, yeah. another topic. That's another topic. Okay, so <laughs> but you know what I'm saying here. Yeah. It's like this is why buying assets in the midst of inflation, where buying assets can kill you, is in a deflation, which eventually they're going to have to do it. That's what we're in the midst of now. These two forces: higher rates, bailing out the banks. We're going head to head. And one of them is going to win at one point, probably inflation, because they're going to have to make a decision whether they collapse the global economy right. to save the dollar, or we're going to go this way where then inflation kicks in, collapses, and then we have deflation. They go hand in hand. Yeah. And, and, and here's the deal, though. The long-term plan for your life, anybody listening to this, is that you don't know when these cycles are going to occur. They are going to occur. They're always going, the pendulum's always going to swing back and forth. We live in a centrally planned economy where they're always going to be tinkering with it. But you need to be in the game with sensible assets that you can afford to hold during the bad times and keep during the good times because both of those times will happen. You've got to adjust your strategy and you're going to win with that. But if you're forever sitting on the sidelines waiting for the perfect timing, guess what? It's never going to happen. Exist. Yeah, the perfect timing never happens. I, I've been waiting for the perfect time to go to Israel for 40 years now. <laughs> yeah. They're not killing each other. Yeah. So I don't get caught in the crossfire. And I've just, uh, it never happened. Real estate investing, same way. And uh, yeah, I just like to point out that during uh, the pandemic and all the inflation that took place, we saw the, most anomalous situation ever in a so-called asset class. Mm -hmm. We saw used car prices right, go up. skyrocket yeah. to the point where they were selling for more than new cars because you couldn't get them. Right. And, you know, my Tesla was worth $25,000 or $35,000 more than I paid I know, for it. Yeah. And now that's normalized, yeah. but that will happen again. There, there are always cycles with all asset classes, right? No question about it. So since you have a lot of experience with the stock market too, and that's where really, you know, the people really try to time the market. Can you talk about market timing for a moment in general? You know, the market timers just never win. The timers don't win, but the cycle guys do. Okay, tell us okay? about that. So cycle investing, everything goes on a cycle. You mm -hmm. know, there's a time we're born, you're a kid, 
then you're a teenager, then you're an adult, then you know you become elderly, and then you die. Right. And it's the same thing with companies. It's the same thing with markets. So you can't time the market to the day unless you're a professional trader. And, he, well, even then, yeah. they obviously can't either. But yeah, but, yeah. but you're a professional trader. Yeah. You got your ear to the ground. You have an advantage. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can get a built in advantage. You know, I've made money, lost money, probably lifetime lost more money in the market than I've made, but not over the past five years because mm -hmm. you have to learn from your lessons there. And the biggest lesson is like I learned from Dallas, from J.R. Hewing never bet the ranch okay <laughs> uh, i know people who bet the ranch and have he, he's done referring really to the well. show and jr ewing the character yeah <laughs> yeah jr never yeah. bet the ranch right. okay right and then always manage risk you're a risk manager you think oh well, i'll just put it in the bank and do nothing you're still taking a risk That's you got inflation all, you know? yeah your money doing nothing so you've got to find a balance look the things that have worked over time and that's not to say they're going to stop working dogs of the Dow. Mm -hmm. Okay. These are huge companies and investing is a lot like fashion. There's trends, there's the hit mini skirt of the day, and then it goes down to a maxi skirt yeah. down to your ankles, mm -hmm. and then it goes back up again. Yeah. So point being that the dogs of the Dow is always one theory that almost always works. And that is the stocks that are doing worse than the Dow, mm -hmm are going to turn around because they're such big companies. Right. They're not they're not likely to go yeah. bankrupt, right? And they're yeah. likely to recover. Right. They and they'll be top performers. And usually those dogs pay dividends. Mm -hmm. So you get paid to wait for them to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So that's one theory that always works. Investing in small cap companies over time outperform large cap companies, but generally the individual can't get enough knowledge to know which ones to yeah. pick. Right now, ETFs are way better than mutual funds. They have tax benefits. They have estate planning benefits. They're also way less expensive than mutual funds. So ETFs are way, way better. But again, there are hidden booby traps in a lot of ETFs, sector ETFs, yeah. especially when they rely upon buying options and futures. They will almost certainly blow up at some time. When the price of oil went negative, the uh, USO, which is the US oil, it's like they had to restructure it. And then when the price of oil was going up, it didn't even reflect it because it was so corrupted. Yeah. So ETFs at this point in time are always better than individual stocks unless you have knowledge. Yeah. Like I've had knowledge of computers, of cars, and I missed Tesla, I missed Apple. Mm -hmm. You know, my sister bought 100 shares of Apple I think like 25 years ago before just one jobs took it over again. And she never sold that. She paid $800. Wow. It was worth, uh, when she sold it, $350,000. Amazing. Amazing. So the buy and hold strategy works, but it doesn't work when you're buying at the peak. Yeah. So the other thing that works is, that I found, when you get a home run on a stock, meaning you've doubled it, Sell half of it. Sometimes you could triple, right. quadruple, sell half of it. That's like a game lock in it. Too. Yeah. yeah. Lock in your yeah. money management. Got it. Got it. Got it. That um, always works. The, the only thing, you know, about dogs of the Dow and just generally with companies in general, very general, mm -hmm. is that the world is now changing so rapidly and technology is changing so rapidly that I just question whether, you know, those strategies still will work in the next 20, 30 years. I mean, we all see what's happening with artificial intelligence and yeah. how it's just going to just massively change the world, you know? But to some extent, everything changes constantly. Yeah. The dividend uh, princes, what they call them dividend aristocrats, another yeah. system that always works. Yeah. Always. Yeah, I and like cash flow. So like I, I'd be, if I was a stock market fan, which I'm not, I would agree with you about dividends is a, is yeah. a good way to... The sector I like now the best of everything from long-term perspective is electric utilities. Mm -hmm. Because whether you agree, and I didn't buy my Tesla because I'm trying to save the planet. Right. That's a ridiculous notion. Yeah. My, 
and the only sustainable energy that we ever found. We had two. Nuclear. We had wood and we had oil. Oil has sustained our world for over 100 years, nuclear to some extent, but costs are too high, yeah. even with these modular plants. So the only sustainable energy that we have is hydrocarbon-based energy. So if we can make it last longer and bring it cheaper through EVs, but point is, going back, EVs are here to stay. Nothing's going to stop them. And if you can invest in utilities that are growing their business anyway, and will get an added jolt from EVs, like we're talking Southern utilities, yeah. Texas utilities, and in the Southwest, almost I would look at the same place where you say, Jason, you buy landlord-friendly jurisdictions. Right. They generally will also be utility-friendly jurisdictions, Interesting. like Florida, like Georgia, to some extent, the Carolinas, Texas, Oklahoma, right. Louisiana, the business friendly states. Yeah. Mostly. Yeah. Yeah. So, Carrie, last thing I just want you to touch on before we go banking crisis. We alluded mm -hmm. to it at the beginning. We've seen some bank failures. Are we going to see more? What oh, is yeah. it? But more importantly, what does it mean to us? Okay. What does it mean to everybody? So, when the banking crisis started, I talked to my partner, Bill Powers. He said, Oh, this is bad. I said, Well, it's bad if they don't handle it correctly. And they didn't. You know, Janet Yellen put her foot down and said, no, we're not going to bail out the banks. All right. This is exactly what they did in 08 and 09. How well did that work? Yeah. No, the point is that what they should have done with Silicon Valley Bank was shut it down over the weekend and say, you're now, uh, congratulations, you are now a depositor in JP Morgan Chase, right? Mm -hmm. That's the proper way to do it. You don't let these things gather momentum. They didn't do it. We lost two other banks as a result that should have never, never crashed. So I always say that banking, the monetary system, currency, paper currency, it's all a confidence game. And you know what the root word of confidence is? Con. Con. Yeah. <laughs> it's all a big con. But yeah. the point is, as long as there's confidence, people don't worry. When they lose confidence, that's the problem. Okay. So basically... You're going to lose like a couple hundred more banks and the big banks, too big to fail, National Bank. Yeah. There's one on every corner now. Yeah. They're going to profit from it. Now, Jamie Dimon said after they took over First Republic, no, we're not going to do anymore. Well, that reminds me of during the, the GFC when uh, Ken Lewis said, no, we, we don't want Merrill Lynch and uh, Treasury Paulson, whoever said, Congratulations, Mr. Lewis. You're now the proud owner of Merrill Lynch. Wait, wait, we don't want it. He said, you, you have to take it. You didn't hear yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> I said, congratulations. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. So that is the way Jamie Dimon can spout out all he yeah. likes. He's going to and, wind up with a third of the bank. If the system. government's trading favors with you, you're going to do their bidding. Yeah. And that's the way it is. Well, yeah. They aren't free banks. They're not really independent companies. Right. I call them stage sets. They're just a branch office of the Federal Reserve and the Treasury. Mm -hmm. That's all they are. Yeah. So they will do, in the end, what they are told. Look, the way the proper way when you have a bad bank is you go in there, you fire the management, you guarantee the deposits, you wipe out everybody else, you sell off the assets, mm -hmm. pay off the difference. Yeah. All right? That's the proper way to do it because eventually those assets will get bailed out by inflation. It's what happened yeah. during the uh, savings and loan debacle in the 80s, going back a long time. It's almost 40 years now. They closed them all out. The RTC took over the assets. They sold them at fire sale prices. Those assets yeah. were worth zillions now. I know people personally who made eight-digit, nine-digit fortunes during the RTC. That's why you can make money during financial crises and why inflation is the asset investor's greatest friend. But the other side is deflation. I just want to tell a little anecdote yeah, that my, sure. my mother told me or my father about the Great Depression. If you walked into a supermarket during the Great Depression with a $100 bill, they didn't have enough cash to change it for you. Mm. All right. So there was a business of discounting $100 bills where you would sell a hundred dollar bill for ninety five or ninety two dollars, and the other person had the cash, 
and they made instant money with no risk. Mm -hmm. There's no risk in that. So that's the flip side of inflation is that eventually deflation will take hold. And that will mean that if you've got cash, it will greatly increase the value of your cash. But on the other hand, it will greatly decrease the value of your assets that are leveraged to the point where you could be upside down. And we've seen this before, deflation in housing prices. So that's where cycles you really need to watch. And you always got to insulate yourself. Don't bet the ranch. In this case, it means find as much non-recourse debt, debt from non-traditional sources where they're not going to be looking at your house to pay off your debt. So that's the only other thing I'd like to just uh, point out. Two-edged sword, but right now, you should be leveraged to the hilts, making money, leveraged to the hilts, yeah. but but not on stupid things. I mean, look, even during the pandemic, flat screen TVs, you could make money on. Right. You I could know. make any, money any, on that, anything. That was a weird, that was an anomaly. So, you know, it, it was an anomaly yeah. then. Right. It's not going to be an anomaly the next time, and it will happen. Mm-hmm. Supply chains will be disrupted by war or whatever. Yeah. You know, inflation isn't just purely a monetary phenomena, which which uh, Milton, Friedman, Milton said. Friedman said it. It is a monetary phenomena, but it can be helped along by supply chain problems and yeah. all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. Good exactly. Stuff. And then that's where we got the famous word transitory from Jerome Powell. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what I say? The best things in life are transitory, they're, they're, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> Carrie, give out your website. Tell hey, people sure. where they can find you. Yeah, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. That's the place to go. Got I think next to Jason, I'm probably the most prolific podcaster on the planet. Over 9,000 episodes. You've got about the same number as I do. Wow, that's amazing. And um, but you made more money at it than me. Well, and (laughs) and, uh, hey, send me an email, kl at kerrylutz.com. Any questions, comments you have, and we're on YouTube. But just go to the site. Everything is there that you need. Excellent. Kerry Lutz, Financial Survival Network, thank you for joining us. A pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.